welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. August 7th, 2021, doing the weekend update here on a Saturday morning. Will bonds redefine equity and index markets? We're going to cover that and much more here on this weekend's update. But first and foremost, the range that has just defined the S&P 500. The other aspect worth noting, yeah, we closed at all-time highs. A little bit lackluster, though. Ton on incredibly low volume inside of the S&Ps, which we'll cover here as well. But uh, first and foremost, you know, I have just mentioned this range inside of the S&P 500 just incessantly, and uh, specifically the range that I am mentioning once again here, the lower edge of it is 4370, the upper edge of it is 4420. There's no question. Yeah, you know, all time high. But at this point, you know, we're, we're at a fairly critical juncture here at the 4430 handle inside of the S&Ps. And this cannot be stressed enough. I mean, you're at a point whereby if you just dribble the market ever so slightly higher, Gamma is going to grip hold, firms are going to come in, and they are going to buy, and we explode off of this level. The reasoning behind this is, and this again, it cannot be overstated. Throughout the course of two weeks of trade, we haven't moved but roughly inside of a 50 handle range. And what occurs, even on low volume, there's low option volume, there's low S&P volume, and there is a reason for it. No one wants to continue to allocate capital when we ain't moving. I mean, that's what I call it, like allocation issues. I have them. You know, if you don't have it, it's because you're not aware that we've been trading in the exact same range for the better part of two weeks. And even though you might think to yourself, well, Don, I don't trade the S&Ps. You know, I'm trading Tesla. I'm trading this. Everything on your screen is going to be impacted when we break this incredible tight range everything because for the most part you know things are heavily correlated there's arbitrage that goes on i mean if they start to turn around and buy the s p's it's going to drive your tesla up it's going to drive your nvidia up okay vice versa if we sell off here hard from this level it's actually going to cause some sell side activity but as i was kind of denoting you know what happens is risk just continues to accumulate in this one area and it grows and it grows into a kind of a crescendo. But for the most part, when you're in a range like this and you just start to break out, when I talk about things like gamma risk, I mean, the way that it works is you might be a retail trader and you've gone out and you buy calls. Okay. Well, that means some firm is selling you those calls. And when the firm sells you those calls, okay, that makes them and implies negative delta. So the second we actually break a range like this, you got to think about all of the trade that's actually occurred in this area. Okay. And as we go up, there's a lot of firms that are going to be heavily, heavily, okay, shifting delta. And that is they have negative delta. Now, will a big trading firm take on negative delta risk? Absolutely, unequivocally not. They're going to add positive delta. How do they add positive delta? by buying S&Ps and they just buy and they buy and they buy and that's how we actually explode out. And that is what we would term the gamma squeeze. And we're right on the cusp of a gamma squeeze to the upside. But I'm going to just throw it out there. We ain't home yet. I mean, when you're like 10 points popped outside of a very key range, it is absolutely like a critical inflection point. But as I said, we're not home yet. We're not necessarily exploding to the upside. But again, you know, you look at the range back to all time highs, but you just don't feel it. When I talk about like the all time highs, I say it's it's a little bit like lackluster. Just to kind of point out, we've had now two consecutive days, both Thursday and Friday this past week. We didn't even clip to one million S and P contracts, which is incredibly low. You want to know like how low? I mean, people love to, you know, have comparison points just to give you an idea. Thursday volume, Thursday's volume, there's almost nothing to compare it to on a year-to-date basis. I mean, there's days in here where, you know, coming into like the holiday, that's about it, but there's almost nothing to compare it to. It is incredibly infrequent to see two back-to-back -back sessions where we're under, okay, 
a million S&P contracts. For the most part, as I said, this deals very large part to allocation issues. And it can, again, as I said, it can't be overstated. When I say there's allocation issues, nobody wants to step forth and put more risk into the exact same standard deviation. So when I when I bring this up, you know, I always talk about like standard deviations. If you think about standard deviation here, we haven't moved outside of the deviation now literally two weeks. So anything you do, it doesn't matter whether you're bullish or bearish, okay? It doesn't matter. You just be stacking more risk right into the same exact standard deviation, this being a deviation curve flipped on its side. And we're just towards like the upper edge of that. We haven't necessarily broken to the upside. If we do, things are going to change. Volume will pick up. You know, it'll get a little bit extreme. And volume will actually be a very definitive sign of us actually breaking to the upside. However, all that being said, okay, as I said, that's kind of the inflection point. This is still anybody's marketplace. This is extraordinarily binary. I wouldn't be surprised to see the S&Ps, okay, on Sunday night initially break higher and then pull back, you know, into the 4420, which changes everything for Monday morning. Again, we really were at that inflection point flip a coin, whether we're headed up or down, the answer is, yeah, we're probably going to head up, then down. Okay. We're going to dance around though, this level before effectively breaking it. But if we do break just a slight bit higher, you're going to see volume explode. It'll be a great confirmation for it. All right. Next on the, uh, on the docket over here, the employment situation, the employment situation did not, at least in uh, most respects, have the effect on markets that uh, I think most people anticipated. When I talk about the employment situation, I'm talking about on uh, Friday morning, the jobs number, it beat, not by a massive margin, but you have to realize that just earlier, okay, this past week, we had an ADP report that was literally half, it was less than half of what it was, uh, you know, expected to be. Then, you know, the federal report comes out and sure enough, it actually beats. How does the market react? initially a bit negative. But by the end of Friday, it's kind of a mixed bag of goods. And I'm going to get into exactly this dynamic. The S&Ps are up, the NASDAQ is down. Okay. This is what I'm going to term as back to bond dynamics. So the employment situation doesn't exactly go off without a hitch because the bonds, they tanked. I mean, take a look at the bond trade. That's one of the larger moves, not the largest move we've seen lately, but you know, two back to back days to the downside it's going to shift, if you will, that bond dynamic into high gear again. So bonds tank, but financials, they absolutely explode. Let's take a quick glance at, all right, financials. And when I'm talking about financials, I'm actually referencing the XLF. Now, the XLF has been utterly stagnant for the better part of the summer. You talk about June, you talk about July, the beginning of August here. We have done absolutely nothing in terms of the financials, the entire move effectively came in the last, uh, you know, 24 hours of trade. We break to the upside. Take a look at auto expected moves. A great way to kind of delineate. We are, uh, we are way outside the upper edge of that expected move inside of the financials. And there's a reason that I'm mentioning this though, because we're going to talk more about financials here, uh, momentarily. Uh, Warren Buffett and, of course, Berkshire Hathaway had earnings today on Saturday. And so actually one of the reasons I waited to uh, record the video, those earnings were decent. Not exactly sure how the market is going to react to it. But one of the things that you have to recognize is the reason that the financials have been flat it's not because the financials themselves are flat. Like you start to look at individual companies like JP Morgan. All right, it's relatively flat, okay? You start bringing up stocks like Citi, okay? All right, it hasn't done that much, okay? But there's going to be some financials we're going to mention here in a moment, including the likes of Goldman Sachs. This thing has been ripping to the upside. Nevertheless, okay, the big dragon here has actually been uh, Berkshire Hathaway which it too hasn't done anything. You'll see that the Berkshire Hathaway looks almost identical to the XLF because again, it's one of its primary constituents. Anyway, with that in mind, it's the financials that actually carried the S&Ps. And that's really the, the impetus for me initially mentioning it to all-time highs. And I keep mentioning how the financials are like the linchpin of the marketplace. So 
financials explode on higher rates. Speaking of higher rates, okay, there's actually the jump in the 10 year. Uh, we came off of 1.15%. Uh, we actually tagged even 1.3%. You know, for those of you that don't speak like Bond Geek, listen, these are just monstrosity moves in an incredibly short period of time, all right, for interest rates. And that's that's all I'm trying to kind of display here inside of the 10-year. And because of these massive moves, the effects upon the equity and index marketplaces, I mean, listen, bonds are going to redefine what you think and what you know about markets because this is where the volatility happens to be. And it sounds so, you know, ridiculous to say this, but when you start looking at products like the TLT, and I, and again, it's one of the reasons I, you know, titled this video this weekend, you know, will bonds redefine equity and index markets? Yeah, you better believe it. Okay. When was the last time that anybody actually took a really good look at some of the bond markets? Most people don't look at something like the TLT, right? The TLT, what is it? Well, this is an ETF of like a 20 year, and a 20 year, really what the TLT is, it's a blend between the 10 year and the 30. Look at its volatility inside of the TLT. All right. I just want to show you the next six days. Okay. It's roughly at 16%. Now, time out. You go, what, is, what, what does that mean? Okay. Well, here, just compare and contrast. Let's go over to the spiders now. To the spiders we go. What are the spiders going to look like for the next six days? Oh, they have what? 10% volatility? So you're telling me that bonds now are what? You know, 50, 60% more volatile than the S&Ps. And the answer is, yeah. I mean, you can even look at like the 30 year. Now the 30 year, this thing is, you know, as boring as can possibly be. But over the next six days, it has the same volatility as the S&P 500. You never thought that bonds might have similar volatility or greater volatility than the NASDAQ. And that's exactly what I'm trying to point out. I mean, the bonds are Mr. Toad's wild ride right now. The IWM is the only major index product that's actually got higher volatility than, for example, the TLT. And it is, uh, it's not just notable. It's what's driving the markets. And for those people that are, you know, you're involved in equity markets and, you know, people have 401ks and IRAs and they don't think that, you know, I'm not in bonds. It doesn't make a difference. But it's the bond trade that's clearly, okay, driving this marketplace. So we look at the bonds tank. The financials explode because the bonds tank. That actually took the S&Ps to effective highs. We do have to worry, though, again, about bonds. CPI is coming. So the calendar is not exactly you know, chock full of, of pitfalls this, uh, this week, but CPI is fairly critical. And for those of you that don't know what CPI is, it's consumer inflation. I think the JOLTS number is interesting. It's not going to move markets. JOLTS is, uh, they call it the take this job and shove it indicator. It's the number of people quitting, uh, jobs, which could be plentiful given the fact that nobody actually wants to go back to an office right now. But, uh, taking a look at some of the, uh, some of the events, if you will, of the week, the real standout to me, again, there's other events. There's no question. You know, jobless claims comes out every Thursday, but the only one that's going to really rock markets is that CPI because the CPI number has come in hot lately. All right. So why mention the CPI? Because we're back to bond dynamics. All right. And let's, let's talk a little bit about the dynamic of the bond trade. And I'm also going to cover a little bit about financials running amok here momentarily, but the, uh, the bond trade, let's, uh, let's get back to some of the basics. So the way, the way that this has worked, if you take a look at the bonds steadily climbing here, okay, that takes what we term rates, okay, down higher bonds, rates go down, rates go down. Well, products like the XLF, are not going to perform well. It's one of the reasons the, the XLF was flat. You see two days, just two days of selling inside, which actually takes rates where? To the upside. So rates go up, the XLF pops. Okay, but there's a portion of this dynamic that we've probably forgotten. And the portion of the dynamic came into play right back here. And that is the moment that the bonds started to sell off, okay, tech also sold off because tech doesn't like what higher rates higher percentage rates have not been good for tech so here we're trapped back again in this dynamic and the dynamic is it's xlf by the way with xlf pretty much goes xle 
The two have actually been trading on a day-to-day -day basis in relative tandem. So those two added together are just about as important as tech, okay? So we have tech, all right, versus this kind of financials and energy complex. And we've actually seen like when tech is going up and the financials are kind of flat and the market might meander a little higher, but if the bonds start to sell off, tech starts to dive, the financials might go up, the market though may actually meander back down. And again, it's kind of a wild dynamic that I want you to think about. So again, as this bond market is impacted to the downside, that can actually really prohibit, you know, big tech from moving forward. And that would be the concern effectively moving forward especially since the CPI number is coming out this week. And I want to be as clear as possible because, you know, I know everybody's very short-sighted. They're looking at the possibility of, you know, the S&Ps. They're right on the upper cusp of this, and they're going to break out to the upside. Nevertheless, imagine if we broke out to the upside. The CPI number comes out, okay, rocks the bond market. And I'm not even going to tell you what the CPI number could be. It doesn't matter whether it's hot, whether it's cold, okay, you're not going to be able to dictate what that order flow is going to be. No matter what the CPI number happens to be, it's going to move the bonds. And that bond dynamic is going to grip hold of this marketplace. Okay. The bottom line is, okay, from where I sit, if the bonds continue to sell off, again, if the bonds continue to sell off, you're going to take tech and you're actually going to start to crush it. So for that, we take a quick glance over at the QQQ. The reason I'm looking at the QQQ is not to mention the chart. Speaking of the chart here, yeah, look, the Qs are up 19%. The spiders are up almost 20%. The Qs are still technically underperforming in a year-to-date basis. But the reason I wanted to bring up the QQQ, the Qs continue okay, to sustain significantly more volatility than does the S&P. So I'm just six days out, and I, I intentionally want to be short-sighted. Okay, I'm six days out. The S&Ps are seeing a 10% implied volatility right? I'm six days out. I look at the QQQ and we'll snap back over here to the Qs. You're looking at a 14% implied volatility, okay? Then you open up like the TLT, that exact same six-day window, and you're at a 16% implied volatility. Tell me the world is not backwards right now. Bonds have the highest volatility. Qs, second highest volatility because they feel like if the bonds move big, it's the Qs that actually could sustain the most risk. Last but not least, the spiders. One other mention of the Qs. The last you know, two weeks on the weekend videos, I've been just barking about the Qs. The Qs are not moving nearly as much. Like the NASDAQ as a whole, it is not moving. And it continues to kind of plague the marketplace with risk. And most people do not see it. You know, but the bottom line is this, the QQQ, you just looked out six days and it's been portraying about a 14% implied movement. The real movement has been about 10%. Okay. The spiders have over that, they're closer to an 11% in terms of realized volatility, yet they actually are paying you implied volatility at a 10% rate. So uh, don't look at the Qs as, oh, there's a lot of edge in them, they're Qs. The Qs are ready to rock. All right, last couple of points I want to make on this weekend's update. We got back to bond dynamics. The financials are running amok. There are a couple of financials that have just maybe fallen off the radar screen, but this cannot be overstated. When I say financials are running amok, it's not all the financials. It's a handful of financials. But if you haven't looked at a chart lately of something like Goldman Sachs, here's an underlying that has done absolutely unequivocally nothing. And that nothing has been going on for a period of 15 years, okay? The stock has doubled since November, literally doubled since November, okay? It is by far and away the largest move that we've seen in this stock, okay, in any recent history. Other, the only move larger than this is coming out of the financial crisis, and it is downright alarming at this point. Right, coming out of the financial crisis, got all the way down to the 50 handle, got us almost back up to the 200 handle here from 200, though, effectively to 400. Uh, 15 years all packed into what a couple of months, not even a full year uh, of movement. Why am I mentioning Goldman Sachs? Because it has now become, okay, for the most part, the preeminent stock 
inside of the Dow. All right, $400 stock. It's right up against United Healthcare. However, Goldman actually carries okay, almost 30% implied volatility. So why are we looking at it? To tell you right now, the Dow and the entire Dow, for the most part, rests heavily okay, on a key financial product, which once again leads back to bonds. And it's, it's critical to understand that dynamic at this point. You know, with Goldman exploded up even in a rough bond environment and continues to propagate gains, breaking out uh, 400 and then some. All right, next on the list over here, and I'll just mention it very quickly, is uh, Discover Financial. Very similar in context coming out of the COVID crash uh, from, oh, basically the $25 mark to $130 stock. I mean, you're looking at stocks that are moving four and five times. Here's another one. I just happen to throw it up here in a 15-year chart. Has done uh, roughly nothing for the, uh, for the past decade and having phenomenal movement to the upside. The uh, last but not least is uh, none other than Morgan Stanley, which uh, has now crested past past, if you will, and a lot of people miss this, it's uh, it's 2007 all-time high and had not reached all-time highs literally until just a, uh, a few weeks back. Nevertheless, stocks having an absolutely blistering move. This is what has actually been the stabilizing bid inside of the financials, the XLF. As I showed you earlier, you know, hey, you got stocks like JP Morgan, okay? They've done nothing. You got stocks like Citi, they've done nothing. You know, how is the XLF still propagating gains? Because there are some maybe off the beaten path stocks that you're not necessarily watching, but Goldman Sachs, it's not off the beaten path, okay? That's again, it's one of the preeminent uh, drivers, if you will, of the Dow. Finally, we come to expected move. Now, expected move to me, it's one of the most important aspects that we uh, cover each and every week. The expected move this week and coming week, I should say, is incredibly, incredibly low. First of all, and never mind mentioning something along the lines of this, the last two weeks, we did not hit the upper or lower edge of the expected move, okay? That is an incredibly small, again, an incredibly small probability of two consecutive weeks not hitting the edge of the expected move. And I, I provide all this data, everybody, but you can actually go back and you start scrolling back and look, like, can you find two consecutive weeks that we did not hit the expected move? And the answer is yes, it does, in fact, happen. Here we are, okay? In fact, we even have almost three weeks, but uh, here's two consecutive weeks that did not hit the edge of the expected move. It's, though, incredibly, incredibly rare. Therefore, okay, we have, at this point, uh, a much higher probability of hitting the upper or lower edge of expected move, given the fact that they crush the volatility. By the way, I'm not saying that because we didn't hit here and because we didn't hit here means we're definitely going to hit here. It's because they've actually crushed the volatility down. The expected move in the previous week of trade was $65. This next week is only $48, all right? Probably me more than anybody is surprised that volatility didn't pick up I mean, here we are now coming into, you know, middle of August. This is the time where volatility really does start to rage in the marketplace. Obviously, September being the uh, one of the most historic volatile uh, months in the marketplace. Volatility typically picks up uh, mid uh, to late August. So to see volatility collapse like this is a bit of a surprise. I uh, urge you at this point in time to be very, very weary. The implied volatility is incredibly low in the shortest duration. In fact, it's really, it's worth kind of exploring this inside of the SPX because we have one of the biggest contangos kind of on record. If you take a look at the short-term volatility, you're sitting, you know, at eight, nine percent. You go a little further out in time. I'm only going, I'm only going like, you know, 69, maybe 83 days out. You're all the way up to a 19 or 20 percent implied volatility, which it implies that like risk now is absolutely nothing, but risk in the future will, of course, continue to grow. With that, though, listen, if you're going to be selling premium, you want to be selling back month premium. Bottom line, short term premium isn't there. Back month premium is absolutely unequivocally there. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theotrade for this weekend's update. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye bye.